that the full bios of the presenters are in your program books. Uh, my intros will be abbreviated so that uh, we give the presenters their full time. Our first presenter is Dr. Adam Shapira. Uh, he is the Senior Electrophysiologist at Advanced Heart Care and Director of the Heart Arrhythmia Center at the Heart Hospital Baylor Plano's Center for Advanced Cardiovascular Care. Dr. Shapira has co-authored a book, uh, a chapter, about catheter ablation safety. And Dr. Shapira will give us an overview this morning about AFib and talk about why it's a problem. Dr. Shapira? Good morning. Uh, Melanie, thank you very much for the invitation to participate. And it's uh, an honor to be here speaking with everyone. Um, I am uh, going to be giving a, a bit of an overview of atrial fibrillation and defining why it's a problem and talking about some of the, the causes that we uh, frequently implicate with, uh, with atrial fibrillation or the causes that are uh, implicated in, in atrial fibrillation. So, um, microphone was sliding. <laughs> um, so, uh, first, and this may be review for, for many folks here, um, but uh, just to go over cardiac anatomy, and uh, this will give us a framework for kind of discussing. Uh, all the future topics that are going to be coming up today. But this is a very simplified schematic of the heart. And um, I'm going to use this one with the pointer. But uh, basically, as uh, we kind of informally refer to them, the top two chambers of the heart would be the right atrium and the left atrium. And the right atrium is located over here. Left atrium is over here. And these chambers will pump blood into the right ventricle and to the left ventricle. And just to give you a brief overview of um, physiology and cardiovascular physiology, blood will flow uh, into the right atrium from the brain and from um, the neck, and then blood is received into the right atrium from the legs and the torso, the abdomen, and um, all the uh, organs in the thorax, uh, and arrives in this uh, um, chamber right here, the right atrium, it gets pumped to the right ventricle, and then from the right ventricle it gets pumped anywhere, uh, it gets pumped into the lungs. And that's where the blood gets oxygenated and then it returns into the left atrium from the lungs via the pulmonary veins, and then it goes to the left ventricle, and then from the left ventricle, the oxygenated blood that uh, actually looks redder once it has oxygen in it will get pumped to the brain and to your, uh, all the organs in the, in the torso <laughs> and down to your legs. Um, so that's kind of an overview of physiology is uh, you can kind of think back on that as the subsequent speakers will talk about atrial fibrillation and its management because all those uh, elements will become relevant. Um, this uh, schematic diagrams roughly what atrial fibrillation is and what is actually going on. So in distinction to this, so before I get to atrial fibrillation, let me briefly mention normal sinus rhythm or normal rhythm, okay? This is the sinus node, this little yellow uh, dot right here in the right atrium. And normally electrical impulses will emanate from that tissue and arrive down in this area called the AV node. And then from the AV node, where the electrical, si electrical system slows that impulse down, it will conduct down to the bottom chambers via the right bundle branch and the left bundle branch, causing the bottom chambers to contract and pump the blood to the lungs or the body, respectively. In atrial fibrillation, that mechanism uh, in the top chambers is subverted. You basically have uh, a lot of chaotic electrical signals are emanating principally from the left atrium, but also to some degree from the right atrium, overtaking the sinus node. So the normal, almost metronomic type pattern of sinus node impulses, okay, is taken over by a lot of chaotic, random, haphazard electrical signals coming from the right atrium and more principally the left atrium. And I mentioned before the pulmonary veins, and uh, our subsequent speakers will talk more about the pulmonary veins, but that's a frequent target for atrial fibrillation because a lot of this chaotic electrical sig uh, signaling that comes from atrial fibrillation will emanate from the tissue around the pulmonary veins. Um, so that's electrically speaking what's going on in atrial fibrillation. Now to define atrial fibrillation, um, it's not just enough to say I have this funny feeling in my chest or I have some uh, you know, irregularity to my heart rate. On an ECG is where we really formally diagnose atrial fibrillation. And this is what atrial fibrillation looks like on an ECG tracing, okay? Now we've seen, there are several ways you can um, uh, assess and, and measure and record an ECG. This is just kind of one line on an ECG. Normally on a full ECG we have 12 of those lines, but this is what it looks like and you get this very kind of chaotic 
wiggly line here between all of these big spikes. And this wiggly line reflects what's going on in the atria, or the right atrium, the left atrium, the top chambers. These spikes here reflect the ventricles, or the main pumping chambers, and when they contract, they create this electrical signal here. In normal sinus rhythm, by contrast, you have this nice organized pattern here. So that's what uh, the definition of atrial fibrillation is on an ECG. What are the risks of atrial fibrillation? This is something that's in, on everyone's mind who has atrial fibrillation or um, cares for someone who has atrial fibrillation. Um, the two principal risks that we get concerned about are increased stroke risk and heart failure risk. Stroke risk is the most important uh, element in, in my view, and um, I know Dr. Prostowski is going to talk about this. But um, what's going on is when the top chambers, uh, the right atrium and the left atrium, are in atrial fibrillation, they're not contracting as well as they normally would in sinus rhythm. And when they don't contract, the blood doesn't slosh around, so to speak. It doesn't move around very much in the top chambers. And when the blood doesn't move around very much, it can form a clot relatively quickly. And when that if, the, if a clot were to form, it then gets sent to the right ventricle or to the left ventricle, and then from there, the muscular chambers of the heart, the ventricles, will pump that blood, including the clot, out into the body, and it can go to the lungs, it can go to the brain, it can go anywhere in the body, but the most concerning is that if it goes to the brain, it can cause a stroke. So that's, that's where um, a lot of the tension and I think the most important uh, element of atrial fibrillation management lies in preventing stroke. Heart failure can also arise. This is another, the second most, uh, second cause of morbidity and mortality or risk in atrial fibrillation. Because when you're in atrial fibrillation, the top, the top chambers will drive the bottom chambers very fast. And if the bottom chambers are going fast for a long period of time, several months, sometimes years, it can weaken the bottom chambers and that can lead to heart failure. And that's a, a major cause of, of risk of death. So, um, Melanie, uh, I'm not sure if Dr. Prasowski is talking about these two slides or not. Um, okay. I'll, I'll mention them briefly. Um, but there are two ways that we can look at stroke risk in atrial fibrillation. There's something called a CHADS-2 score, which is a little bit older risk modification scheme to assess someone's risk of having a stroke. So if someone has heart failure, if they have high blood pressure, if they're, over the, if they're 75 years of age or older, if they have diabetes, or if they've had a stroke, they get a certain number of points. You get one point for everything except for stroke history where you get two points. And then you can look on the right-hand side of the screen. You can tally up a score. And if your score, your score can go anywhere from zero to six. And as you see, the more risk factors uh, you accrue, the more clinical parameters that are identified on the left-hand side of the screen that you accrue, the higher your risk of having a stroke. And this uh, annualized stroke risk here will help determine whether we anticoagulate someone with just an aspirin or with something more potent like Coumadin or some of the newer anti-thrombotic uh, agents that are out. Um, and I know some of the substance speakers are going to be talking about some of those options because those are good questions that a lot of people have now as to which anticoagulant they should be on. This is a newer score that's a little bit, uh, uh, drills down on a couple more clinical elements and uh, is felt in some ways to more accurately define stroke risk, but it's not yet incorporated into formal guidelines. But just to give you an introduction to this, uh, you see some of the familiar faces from the prior slide. You have heart failure, high blood pressure, age, uh, stroke history, but also vascular disease. And then uh, age is broken up in a little bit uh, more detail here between 65 and 74 years of age. And then uh, being female gender uh, will also confer higher risk. So this gives you a little bit, um, uh, I'm not going to say more accurate, but a different perspective on stroke risk right now. So question that always comes up is, what did I do to cause this? Why do I have atrial fibrillation? And quite honestly, a lot of time and most of the time in, in my practice, there's really no good answer. Um, so uh, there's a lot of things that can contribute to the development of atrial fibrillation, and I've listed a lot of them here. You can have valvular heart disease where the valves in the heart are not functioning as well as they should, and you can get backwards blood flow or you can get lack of blood flow across one from one chamber to another, and that can cause... Uh, pressure changes in dilation of the chambers that can lead to atrial fibrillation, high blood pressure, diabetes, heart failure. Um, thyroid abnormalities can lead to uh, atrial fibrillation, alcohol use, um, nervous system abnormalities where the, the nerves that innervate or that go to the heart release an abnormal amount of chemical neurotransmitters, what we call it, and that can predispose someone to atrial fibrillation. 
uh, genetic factors, cardiac surgery is a very common cause of atrial fibrillation, uh, chronic kidney disease, um, obesity, metabolic syndrome, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is a big long term that basically refers to thickening of some of the heart muscle walls, um, coronary disease, and inflammation. So there's a whole host of these things, and it's not uncommon to have uh, a patient that has multiple elements that you've seen listed here. Um, genetics, um, uh, Melanie wanted me to mention um, uh, the role of genetics, and this is a little bit unclear uh, right now, but this diagram here is not uh, anyone who has atrial fibrillation. It just kind of shows you what we're looking at when we consider genetics in someone uh, with a uh, medical condition. Uh, this would be a man, and this would be a woman, and then this reflects their offspring, and you can see some of the offspring marked by the black box are affected by uh, the condition, a generic condition. In this case, you know, it might be atrial fibrillation. But um, the bottom line with the genetics, in, in my view, is that it's not really completely understood right now. We don't really do anything to target genetics uh, in atrial fibrillation and its role in atrial fibrillation, but it, in all likelihood, has some causal role. Um, the role of sleep apnea, this is another common thing that we see in folks that have atrial fibrillation is the presence of sleep apnea. What sleep apnea is is uh, lack of normal airflow uh, through the nasal passageway into the back of the throat. And you can see in the diagram there when, eight, when the nasal passage or the tongue falls back on the airway, you don't get as much oxygen or you don't get as much air into the lungs, um, uh, into the airway and into the lungs. And the decreased oxygen quantity in the blood and pressure changes and all these things can lead to atrial fibrillation as well. So I just want to mention that because that's a common player with atrial fibrillation. What does atrial fibrillation feel like? Well, it can feel like just about anything. There's no real specific way it feels. Some people feel palpitations. Some people feel like, quote, fluttering sensation. Some people feel a skip beat. And some people feel things that aren't related to the heart at all. It could be anxiety or sweating or fatigue or nausea. So uh, it's really all over the place. And just because you have one of these elements or one of these symptoms doesn't mean you have atrial fibrillation. But by the same token, your atrial fibrillation or someone's atrial fibrillation could manifest with one of these symptoms. So symptoms aren't terribly helpful, but they're debilitating to their problem. That's really what we're targeting when we're trying to get someone back into sinus rhythm uh, with some of the uh, therapies that we have. How do we diagnose it? Well, I mentioned ECG before. Symptoms are sometimes a player. If someone has symptoms and they, then we document that they're in atrial fibrillation when they have those symptoms, then moving forward, that can be a reliable marker that, hey, I'm in atrial fibrillation again, or hey, this person is in atrial fibrillation again. Holter monitor and event monitors are more long-term ECG monitoring techniques where you go home and you wear a couple uh, stickers on your chest with some wires that are attached to like a little pager and uh, that can monitor uh, for the presence of atrial fibrillation. Um, types of atrial fibrillation, these terms may come up during subsequent talks. So um, lone atrial fibrillation, we really don't use that term very much anymore. I put it on here just because some of you all may have heard of it. Uh, lone atrial fibrillation is atrial fibrillation that really has no underlying cause and is really occurring in the absence of any other significant medical problems. Uh, the more commonly, term, commonly used terms are paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, persistent atrial fibrillation, long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, and then chronic atrial fibrillation. Basically, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation comes and goes. Um, it's formally defined as more than two or more episodes of atrial fibrillation within one week, and these episodes typically can last up to 24 hours, but they don't have to. But the bottom line is with paroxysm, it comes and goes on its own. Persistent atrial fibrillation, we really need to do something to get someone back into normal rhythm. Okay, So you have to have a cardioversion or you have to have a medication or a shock uh, or a medication to get someone back into normal rhythm. Long standing persistent has been there for a long time, but it hasn't quite gotten to the point where someone has said, we're just going to leave you in atrial fibrillation all the time, or I just want to be in atrial fibrillation all of the time. And that's what chronic atrial fibrillation is. People are in it all of the time, and we're not going to do anything, and they're not going to do anything to try and get themselves back into normal rhythm. Um, so moving forward for the rest of the talks, I thought this might be a helpful framework for thinking about atrial fibrillation. Is One, what are we going to do to anticoagulate someone? And that's based on that CHADS-2 score, the CHADS-VASC score that I mentioned before. What are we going to do to make sure the heart rates don't go too fast and don't lead to excessively rapid heart rates for many, many months leading to heart failure. So you see stroke and heart failure are the first two elements here. And then rhythm control is more of the symptom control. And that's more of a soft endpoint here in terms of uh, management of atrial fibrillation. What do we do to make someone feel better? So as you hear the rest of the talks throughout the day and as you think about atrial fibrillation, this as an electrophysiologist is the way that I think about atrial fibrillation. I think it would be a helpful way for 
uh, for anyone who has atrial fibrillation to think about it. What are the three things that I'm doing to target AFib on these three fronts? So with that, uh, if there's, I don't know if you want to do questions yeah. now. Or okay. So let's open it up for questions. Does anyone have a question for Dr. Shapira about, uh, you know, understanding atrial fibrillation? Um, what are the risks of atrial fibrillation? And Melissa is walking around with the microphone to um, allow you to ask your questions. I have um, aortic stenosis and I'm moderate. Okay. I'm currently under investigation for AFib with an event monitor. And um, I've had a little bit of sensations of all of this going on, but I had sort of a little emergency after I started taking an increase of niospan, and that's, it seemed to happen almost right away. Yeah. Is there a possible correlation? That's a good question. Um, a lot of times, uh, correlations uh, with um, starting a certain medication, and then you notice immediately afterwards that you're having more palpitations or more whatever symptoms, in all likelihood, there is, there very well may be a role in, in linking the two. Um, however, and I tell this to folks all the time, atrial fibrillation is so common, and particularly in the setting of valvular heart disease, it may have happened anyway. So there's not really going to be, uh, uh, I think, a clear-cut way to link the two. However, if you stop the medicine and it goes away, then it might be that the that that medicine is causing that. But it's nice and can frequently cause flushing and a sensation of warmth and rushing, you know, to your face and your head. And um, atrial fibrillation for some folks can feel the same way. So um, uh, you're dealing with, unfortunately, with AFib, we're dealing with a bit of a, a chaotic element. And as the electrical uh, pathways and, and patterns in atrial fibrillation are itself chaotic, the clinical manifestations of it, meaning how it shows up, you know, and how people experience it can also be a little bit random too, so. I think there's a question over there. Marcia? Yes. You speak about uh, AFib triggers, including some more popular medications that are prescribed. Well, um, can you be a little more specific? Well, foods that we might eat, alcohol. Sure. sure. Now, there's, um, okay, so that's a very good question. A lot of people will note that when, you know, I hear, you know, if they eat, a certain type of cold food or they drink a cold drink or they have alcohol or they exercise or, or they do whatever uh, um, activity or, or eat some sort of, uh, of food that they always go into atrial fibrillation or they notice a, more, more palpitations when that happens. And I mentioned in one of the slides that there's um, nervous system abnormalities. There's a, a nerve that runs from your brain down through your entire digestive system called the vagal, vagus nerve, okay? And that, you know, uh, does, um, Basically, we refer to the vagal nerve and, and its role as vagal tone. And the vagus nerve runs right by your esophagus and it runs through a lot of your digestive system, as I mentioned. And things like cold water, it's postulated that when you drink cold water, it can sometimes cause an excess triggering of this nerve. And it can, the release of neurotransmitters from this nerve can sometimes lead to atrial fibrillation. And in fact, when we do AFib ablations, um, we target the pulmonary veins, which I mentioned before, but we also target these, we call them plexi or plexus, where, where the nerves kind of come together and a lot of the nerves come together on the back wall of the heart. And the ablation also will target that tissue as well. We can't really define where that tissue is as readily as we can define where the pulmonary veins are. But to speak to your question now, um, some triggers you mentioned like uh, that I come across, drinking cold water, you know, can sometimes trigger that area. Now certain medications have certain chemical components to them. Uh, that uh, can alter other medic alter other neurotransmitters or other chemicals in your body that may make it more likely to go in a, you to go into atrial fibrillation. So something that has the same effect as caffeine on your body. You've heard of the fight or flight response, and uh, that kind of gets everything revved up in your body in terms of the human body scared, so it's going to run away from something. Well, the same thing can uh, activate the heart and cause the heart rate to increase and can sometimes trigger atrial fibrillation in some folks. And thyroid abnormalities, for the same reason, these chemical components in the bloodstream can sometimes trigger atrial fibrillation by uh, mainly affecting neurotransmitters and, and nerve ending chemicals. Great. Any other questions? Yes, one there. In your opinion, 
how high does your score need to be before you think it's uh, necessary to have the more pricey alternatives to aspirin? The more what? I'm sorry, Miss. Pricey, pricey alternatives. Okay, I gotcha. Um, well, there, there's two there's two elements of that question. There's the priciness question, and then there's you know the movement from aspirin to another. Well, if you've got a if you go by the old score, okay. Well, if you've got a score of zero, I think you know everyone would. Uh, I don't think you'd come across a lot of controversy in terms of going with an aspirin. Okay, when you start hitting the score of one, is when we start moving into the wiggle room of. Does someone need to be on a more potent blood thinner, or do they need to be on just an aspirin? And that is modified by your risk of bleeding. Okay, so if someone's risk of bleeding is higher than their risk of having a stroke, then we favor not being as aggressive with anticoagulation. If someone has a very low risk of bleeding, then we recommend going ahead and, and, and putting them on an anticoagulant. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, yeah, we can take one more. I want to know whether or not the ejection fraction uh, plays any kind of a role in giving you clues. It does. Um, anyone who has heart failure is at risk of having atrial fibrillation. So there's an increased risk of, of atrial fibrillation in someone who has heart failure. And the ejection fraction, uh, for those aren't, who aren't familiar with that term, that's an index or a percentage of blood that's ejected from the left ventricle, the main pumping chamber in the heart, uh, per heartbeat. And when that ejection fraction starts to decline, normally it's about 50, 55 percent in that range. Um, when it starts to decline, that indicates heart failure, okay? And folks that have heart failure uh, are also at risk of having atrial fibrillation. So to answer your question, yes, the ejection fraction does play a role in determining someone's risk of atrial fibrillation. Okay. Great. Thank you so uh, much, thank you very Dr. Much. Shapiro. Thank you.